Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth. I'm Cesar Carino, your host, and our special guest today is Father Jerry Hall. Father Hall, we are looking at you and thinking to ourselves, you certainly aren't old enough to give us much history of Wadsworth, and that's not why we brought you here today, <laughs> Father. We're bringing you here because you are making history. You have made history for Wadsworth. You are the first boy from Wadsworth, first man from Wadsworth, ever to become a Greek Orthodox priest, number one. You are the only one uh, whom we have had so far who has been the grandson of one of our former mayors, mm -hmm. Jerry Hall. And, of course, you're named after him. Sure. Now, by the way, did you get your first name from him, too? Is Jerry your first name, or is there H in front of that as well? No, my, Jerry is my first name. But your grandfather's name was? Harry. Harry Jerry, Jerry Hall. Hall. Right. Right. And uh, we knew that one, but I thought maybe you had the, you were the third or the second or something no, of this nature. No. So you just, Father Jerry Hall. And probably the only one whose uh, father and son, or rather, uh, uh, relationship. We had your father on here, uh, Jack Hall, mm -hmm. Jackson Hall. We had a, a uh, mother and son on earlier, and that was uh, Geneva Weltstein and Dan Weltstein, but uh, this is the only father-son. So we have a lot of firsts here, Father. Tell us a little bit about your birth and your growing up in Wadsworth and where you went to high school. You probably went to this very building where we are right now, didn't you, Father? Tell us a little bit about that. When were you born? Are you sensitive about your age? No, no. Okay, tell I was us born in, in 1955. So 1955. Now. Wow, you're and just a young kid. Yeah. Oh, boy. And uh, grew up here in Wadsworth, went to all of the, through the public school system here in Wadsworth, graduated from Wadsworth High. It was interesting to just pull up here today and, and see things, some of the things are still the same and, and, and many things uh, have differ, differed. Uh, and what are some grown. of the things that are the same and some of the things that are different, Father? In Wadsworth? Yeah, I mean in, in the, the high the, school. The high school, well, you can see the, the sort of the, the, the main core of the high school is still the same, but it certainly has grown out around it. and. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just... Uh, now you're only, what, 41 years old? Correct. And these kids who are here are 20 years younger than you. You graduated about 20 years ago or so? Yeah, 1974. 74, so mm -hmm. a little bit more. Almost 25. 25 years ago. Um, what do you recognize as the kids being today compared to when you were here? Any difference at all? When you walk through the hallway to get to this studio today, no, I think they look the, they look same, the, same. Look the same. Yeah, they're still sitting in the in the commons and right. uh, just as we did uh, twenty five years, years ago. Sure. Tell us, brothers and sisters, and all of that. I have uh, two sisters, and they uh, are and Melanie and uh, Jennifer. And where are Melanie and Jennifer? They're living in one is living in Charlottesville, Virginia. She's married, has children. The other is married in, with children, living in Fremont or in uh, Perrysburg. Perrysburg, in the Ohio. western part of Ohio. Yeah. and they are teachers. No, the one, the one is a teacher and the other works for Heinz. And which one is the teacher? Melanie. And she married a, a young man from Georgia, did she not? Well, actually, she married a, a Wadsworth man as well, David Irwin. Oh, David Irwin. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. And okay. uh, so they were high school sweethearts. and They got married. They got married yeah. and they went to school in Georgia. And you graduated from high school in 25 years ago and then in 1972. Then what did you do, Father? Well, from, uh, from here I went to Ohio Northern University, went to, uh, far entered pharmacy school, a five-year program there, and, and graduated from uh, the pharmacy school in 1979, and uh, met my wife in pharmacy school, and then we, uh, she was a pharmacist as well. And we came back to the, to the Akron area to begin our, our professional careers in 1979 when we got married. As pharmacists. As pharmacists. Tell us a little bit about your wife, who now is, has a title, since you, you were a Greek Orthodox priest. The wife of a Greek Orthodox priest is called Presbytera, is that Correct. right? Correct, Presbytera. And her first name is Helene. Helene. So we call her Presbytera Helene. Mm -hmm. Right. Tell us a little bit about Presbytera Helene. Well, Helene is... Uh, of uh, Greek descent, both of her parents are, are Greek Americans. Married name, or, or maiden name. Maiden name was Theodore. She Theodore. was raised in Euclid, Ohio, and um, father's name is Ted Theodore. Ted Theodore. Father Ted Theodore and I went to school together at Baldwin Wallace many many years ago, fifty years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's still in involved with Baldwin Wallace. Yes, he is. A tremendous person. Good, best public relations man. Very I've dynamic ever known. individual. Very, very good. Very good person. And her mother is? Her, her mother is Irene. Irene and what? And was Irene uh, Theodore, or Irene Paul, she Paul. was born. And, and she also went to school with me. Right, at Baldwin Wallace. They yes. were both in education. Irene Paul and Ted Theodore were both in school with me. And then what a tremendous coincidence when I learned that um, uh, you had married their daughter. Now, 
you were in pharmacy for a long time before you became a Greek Orthodox priest. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us what was the transition between being a pharmacist and try, then, then becoming a Greek Orthodox priest. And perhaps you might even want to start with the fact that <clears throat> uh, the Greek Orthodox almost never convert and that if you marry into their families, you almost have to convert to that religion. Is right. that correct? When I, when I was, it's sort of an interesting story about how I found out about Orthodoxy being raised here in Wadsworth. There weren't very many Orthodox uh, people. I really didn't know anyone who was, uh, was of the Orthodox faith growing up. And uh, Helene and I had just uh, started to, to date at the end of our college career. And uh, I asked her what she was going to be doing for the weekend. And she told me that she was going to be going home for, for Easter. At which time you had already celebrated your exactly. Easter. Exactly. And I thought, I, I was confused. I said, what are you saying to me? And uh, so she related that uh, she was Greek Orthodox and that the, uh, the date of Easter was, was different. And so that was the first time I heard anything about, um, about the Orthodox faith. And Father, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Orthodoxy here, about Orthodoxy here, because uh, Wadsworth still does not have very, very many Orthodox people. Uh, we have some, but not too terribly many of them. Uh, would you mind telling us how you did grow up? You grew up as a Protestant in what church? I grew up uh, in the United Church of Christ mm -hmm. and grew up and raised in, in Trinity, right on uh, Right, on and High your Street. parents are still very and active my, there. My parents uh, went to that church, and uh, um, my father was raised in that, uh, right, that community right. as well. So tell us then, you met uh, Presbyter Helene, and then you, from that point on, you did what? Well, from that point on, we, as I said, we got married. And, and where uh, were you married? We were married in Cleveland. And where? At St. Constantine and Helen Parish in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, came back to the Akron area to begin our, our careers, as I said. And Helene said to me, um, I, I really don't want to leave my, my faith. I, I, I believe that this is where I, should, I want to stay. And I said, that's fine. And I was happy to sort of accompany her um, at the beginning of our marriage to, uh, to her parish, to her, to her church. And, um, just found myself very at home there. We got involved with the uh, with the choir in the in the uh, in the church, and um, something about the, the 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 church, the services, seemed to uh, so really to, to really touch me. And um, so it was then during the uh, the first year of our marriage that um, I decided that I did want to convert and uh, become a member of the uh, of the Orthodox Church. So um, so I did do that. And uh, then we began, um, began our family and um, continued working. And um, I was in a, a partnership in a, in a drugstore downtown Akron, Ray's Discount Drugs. And um, I think it was just being in the business world and, and with the, the partner that I had really um, gave me some cause to think about the way that I wanted to live my life and the philosophies that I was going to live my life by. And, and that really caused me to do a lot of soul searching. Um, this is, you know, within about three or four years after beginning my pharmacy career. And uh, began to, uh, to really think about what it was I wanted to do and how I wanted to live my life. And uh, began to, to really seriously pray about that. And at the same time, I um, began to uh, want to look more deeply into my Orthodox faith, began to do a lot of reading about the... Uh, the, uh, some additional reading and study about the, the faith and the church and, um, and this taking seriously my, my spiritual life and finally came to a point one day where I, I, I asked God and I said to him, whatever it is that you want me to do, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I had a very strong sense of, of peace about that. I didn't know what the answer was going to be. And uh, shortly after that, um, one evening I was doing some reading and, and the thought just sort of came into my mind about the priesthood. And it was sort of like the key just going in the lock, just sort of that little click that uh, seemed sort of right, but at the same time I thought, this is, this is crazy, I'm not, I'm not Greek, I, don't, I haven't been raised in this, this, this faith and this culture. But uh, the, the more I thought about it the, and the more I prayed about it, the, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And uh, didn't, uh, didn't share any of this with, with anyone for, for a while and just continued to do some, some reading and some further study. And uh, one night, uh, Helene and I were sitting in our living room, and she was working on a project, and I was reading something, and uh, all of a sudden she just sort of puts down her work and looks at me and says, just tell me one thing, tell me you're not going to become a, a, a priest. 
She said that. Yeah. Wow. Um, because she was noticing my, you know, my greater um, sort of interest and and uh, commitment to our to the to the faith, and uh, it was at that point I said, well, I can't tell you that that I haven't thought about that, and so that sort of opened the door for us to begin to talk about that, and um, after that happened, within um, within nine months, we had sold our home and moved to Boston, and I was enrolled in the seminary. Now. A Greek Orthodox priest has to speak Greek. Yes. How did you learn Greek? Well, I began the process, uh, since I knew I was going to be going up to the seminary, with uh, Presbyteria Zafra Bartz, who was um, the, the wife of the uh, pastor at Annunciation, Father, Father George, George Bartz. Bartz, at that time, who, um, who went to a, a program um, many years ago with, uh, called St. Basil's Academy, which trained um, young women to do religious and Greek education. So she was trained to, to teach, you know, Greek school. And um, so since I knew I was going to be going and taking, you know, uh, Greek language classes, I, I began doing some study with her initially to just get some basics and, and um, began to do that before I left. And then, of course, during the uh, four-year seminary program, I had um, four years of, of, of language classes. Now, the language of Greek, the Greek language which is spoken in the Orthodox Church is classical Greek, is that correct? Yeah, actually it's called New Testament or Hellenistic Greek. Right. There was a Different from the Greek which is spoken on the streets? Correct. Um, did you learn both? I did learn both. Um, I learned the, uh, the Hellenistic Greek mostly in, the, in, in terms of studying the New Testament and, and, um, and that rather than, and then, but there was a greater emphasis placed um, on the uh, on the spoken Greek because of the the need to be able to uh, to do that to to minister to sort of a, a mixed a mixed group of people at this point in time with uh, some who are who have spoken a lot of Greek and that's their first language and and feel more comfortable speaking that but yet we have a mixture of people who who English is their first language as well. You grew up in Wadsworth in a Protestant denomination. With a, with, a, with a family, with a very, very old family in Wadsworth. Culturally, there was absolutely nothing Greek about your background. Nothing. Culturally. Tell us some of the really severe obstacles that you had to overcome, both from yourself and from your parishioners, as a non-Greek convert and then probably as their priest. Well, I, I guess as, as strange as this might seem, I, I really haven't encountered too many obstacles um, as far as that. The, the Akron community has, has just been a really wonderful community. Um, they're, they're very open to, uh, to people. There's, there's many, many people who, who come into uh, to all the Orthodox communities now from, from varied and diverse backgrounds. I think if this may have been um, you know, 20 years ago, things would have been a lot different, but, um, but things have, have not been, I haven't really met a lot of resistance from, from um, the parishioners or just, you know, from people in general. They've been very open and very accepting. And how about the problems that you had to overcome, just becoming a, a Greek, as it were? Well, I think that's, I was thinking about that on the way here, how um, I really have become an, immersed in a, in a culture and, and a heritage that, uh, that really didn't, um, didn't belong to me, but it's something that, um, that I've very much enjoyed um, being a part of and, and learning about. And um, I guess because, because my children are, are half Greek um, and, uh, and my wife is Greek and there's, there's that whole part of our family, it's something that we do and, and share as, as a family and now as a, as a, as a Greek Orthodox community. What about some of the temporal things, such as um, uh, the Greek food, which of course is not very difficult to take, as a matter of fact, it's very good, um, coming from steak, potatoes, and uh, green beans. Mm -hmm. how, did, how, did, how did you work that out? Um, I think just uh, being open to trying you know, new things and being involved in, in different things. I, I think I'm sort of an adventurous kind of person anyway, and so um, was willing to, to dive into to new experiences. When you graduated from the seminary in Boston, and that isn't the only seminary in the United States, but that's the... Right, that's the, uh, 
the Holy Cross in, in Brookline, Massachusetts is the one that um, is, is an archdiocesan, Greek archdiocesan institution. So predominantly the, uh, the priests that serve the parishes in this country are, um, attend there and, and then come out of there. They come out of there. Where did you go from there? And how long did it take you to go through the, the well, that seminary? Was a, the seminary was a four-year program. Um, if you come in from another discipline, it's a Master's of Divinity program. If you come in from another discipline, it is a four-year program to um, sort of get you caught up on a few of the classes you would have taken as an undergraduate in their program. Um, from, from there, it was, again, I guess we just, I look at it as the, as the hand of God in our, in our lives, was that um, we finished the, uh, the program in 1988. And it just so happened that um, there was a, a position available back in Akron where I had really come into the faith and um, we left there thinking, we, we said goodbye to everyone thinking this is it for, for us and, and for Akron, Ohio. And um, it happened that the uh, position for the assistant uh, priest in Akron was available and Father Bartz contacted me and um, we really had to make some some tough decisions about whether we uh, whether that was the right thing to do. I had a, you know, I had a previous relationship with him as as my pastor. Um, his uh, his daughter and son-in-law were my, one of my son's godparents. So we had, you know, we had already sort of forged these sort that of. That was family. Zoe. Yeah, Zoe and, Zoe. and Dan McClure. I had I had all of Father Bartz's stu uh, children at the university. Oh no, kidding. Mm -hmm. Um, so we already had forged some, some family relationships, some social relationships. Excuse me, I didn't have Bill, Father Bill. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, yeah, I had the girls. And uh, um, so we were a little bit concerned about how, how that would play out coming into this relationship um, as a working relationship. But uh, talking with Father George and, and then uh, getting the bishop's blessing to, to come ahead, uh, we decided that we would we would see and, and would come back to the to the Akron area. So we came back in, like I said, in the summer of 1988. Um, I had uh, took a, a five-week uh, trip to uh, to Greece with some of my classmates where we did a little bit of additional um, study and, and visited uh, this place called Mount Athos, which is a 1100-year-old center of uh, monasticism, Orthodox monasticism, and then in September, came back and um, began my ministry with um, with Father Bartz, and uh, we were able to work very well together. And uh, so I stayed. Um, normally, the the p position of the assistant is a is a two to three year position of uh, doing some training and getting your uh, sort of getting yourself ready to go out and to become a pastor of another community. But um, we had a very good working relationship and. Um, decided that we would, we would stay on. So I stayed for, for six years and uh, as the assistant. And um, people would say to me, are you still the assistant in Akron? You know, after, after four or five, five years. And then um, after those six years, uh, Father Bartz announced his, his retirement. And, um, and then we began a sort of a year-long process of, of working with, uh, with the bishop and the archdiocese. Um, as to uh, as to whether or not I would uh, be able to stay on as the pastor, um, it was a unique situation because um, most of the time they, they, they don't always they don't like to um, to move the person who was the assistant right into that uh, that uh, pastorship position. It just uh, creates some opportunities in, in in parishes if they do that for someone to um, maybe make some political moves and and create some situations where they can usurp the pastor's authority and then you know take that position so they don't often do that but um, the the parish the majority of the parish spoke very loudly um, to the bishop about uh, me uh, and wanting Helene and I to stay on and um, so it took took a few months of, of working with the bishop and the um, and the archbishop but uh, eventually it was settled and uh, I was asked to stay and have been assigned there as the, as the pastor for the last uh, three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. And this is a very unique parish because um, in, um, in 71, the parish is, is well over 75 years. We're coming up, we're actually just about to have just passed our 80th uh, anniversary mark. But um, in 71 years of that uh, history, there have been uh, three pastors. 
the Father Bartz was there for, for 38 years, and his predecessor was for 30, and now I've been there for three. Who were the previous predecessors? Um, Father John Kapanakis was the uh, priest before Father George Bartz and then myself. And uh, before that, there was sort of a, a flow of um, some itinerant priests who were coming through as, as parishes were being established in the early, uh, you know, in 1916, in the early uh, 20s. Uh, um, there was just some, some people who would come and, and not stay for as long until, until Father John came. Father, your mother and father are uh, still very heavily immersed in the Wadsworth community, the fabric of Wadsworth. Um, they are heavily immersed in their own spiritual traditions, and they're heavily immersed in the customs that their parents gave them. Mm -hmm. How do they reconcile your different approach to a theology now, and perhaps even to the um, expression of religion? Um, acceptance, uh, support, uh, how? My parents were, were, were very, very supportive. Um, it just that, that was the way they raised us, for one thing. They were just supportive of all of our, of all of our endeavors, whatever they were. Um, and uh, so when I chose to become a Greek Orthodox, they were, they were there and participated in the, in the service when I became, became Orthodox and, and um, as well supported us through the, through the, uh, the seminary years and, um, and just have been, been very supportive. And, and they have become... Um, uh, Really, really, very much um, a part of of the Annunciation community as well. People know them and are they're they're very welcome there, and um, have become increasingly active in, in my parish as well. But they aren't Orthodox. Not yet. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Orthodoxy. Uh, you mentioned the bishop, you mentioned the patriarch, and you mentioned or rather the um, archdiocese rather, mm -hmm. and of course we do know about the patriarch. Um, we don't necessarily need to have the entire history of uh, orthodoxy because that is many thousand years old, and we don't sure, expect within correct. the next few minutes for you to do that. <laughs> but can you tell us the the structure of orthodoxy, how it is uh, designed, how it is governed, and how you fit into that, and to whom you report, and all of those kinds of things. And then mm -hmm. after that, I'm going to ask you some other questions about some differences in Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, for instance, as compared to Protestantism and the amalgamation of all three of those in uh, what I heard you say a little while ago that uh, the uh, diversity seems to be a, now a part of Orthodoxy. So let's start with the, um, the structure of the church, of the Greek Orthodox Church and how you fit into that. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's, a, it's a hierarchical structure of church, the, uh, the bishop basically being the um, the main ecclesiastical authority. And where is um, he and who is he? My bishop is uh, Bishop Maximus of Pittsburgh. He has a diocese of Pittsburgh which encompasses about 50 parishes in the Ohio, Pennsylvania, and, uh, and West Virginia area. So he is, he's my boss. Um, it's his, his responsibility and, and every bishop's responsibility to see that um, the faith that is being passed on, that is being practiced, in, in the parishes under his, under his jurisdiction is, is consistent with the, the faith of orthodoxy that has, has been perpetuated for, for 2,000 years. Um, and so he, he's, uh, that's his responsibility. Um, as I said, I am directly responsible to, uh, to him. Now, you are permitted to be married as a Greek Orthodox priest. Is your bishop? No. The, the bishops are taken from the, uh, the ranks of, of celibate priests. And is there a reason for that particularly? Well, my, I have, a, I have a, a sort of a theory about that. In, initially, early on in the, in the early years of the priest, we, priest or the, in the church, we know that the apostles were married and, and some of the early bishops as well were married. Um, I think what happened as, as time went on, in the, in, as you see the, the very important responsibilities that the bishop has theologically, um, there was a need for those bishops, those people, candidates for the episcopacy to be theologically trained. And um, most of that theological training early on in the early centuries of the church happened in the monasteries. They were like the modern day universities. They were, they were the ones that had the manuscripts and, and uh, all of these ancient treasures that, that could be studied. And um, so I, I think it sort of flowed, uh, was a natural progression out of that to, uh, to begin to choose 
our, our candidates for the episcopacy from, from those who were trained in the monastic tradition. Now, Bishop Maximus is the bishop of the Pittsburgh Diocese. How many dioceses do we have of the, Roman, of the Greek Orthodox Church in the United States? There's, there's nine dioceses. And where are United some States. of the other ones? You don't have to name all of them. They're located in San Francisco, Atlanta, um, New York, Boston, Chicago. The main... Um, main big yeah, cities, Yeah, main right? geographical And cities. what about the south, in the south? Well, we have um, Atlanta. It basically takes care of the south. Um, and, um, and then there's one in Denver as well that takes care of the Southwest. Now, Bishop Maximos' name is not Maximos. Uh, how do they select their names? Well, everyone is, uh, is selected a, a particular saint's name that, uh, that they usually take as, at the point when they are ordained, most of the time to the, to the priesthood. And uh, so that's a name that they have um, from that ordination. Now, the patriarch, I'm sorry, the, the bishop is a new bishop. Our Archbishop, you mean? No, well, uh, is your Archbishop new? Archbishop. But the, uh, new, the Bishop is not new. Bishop Maximus has been um, the Bishop of Pittsburgh for about uh, 17 years. 17 years. And do you know him personally? Oh, yeah. And you do report to him and go to the meetings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, to whom does Bishop Maximus um, report? Well, Bishop Maximus is, is sort of responsible to um, both to the, to the Ecumenical Patriarch and to the Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople. And can you, give the, can you explain that to us? Well, basically, um, in the uh, early 20s, when, when, the church was the, when the Greek Orthodox Church was being um, organized here in the United States, the, um, the administrative authority or jurisdiction came under the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople under the Patriarchate of Constantinople, which, of course, is in Turkey. Right. Okay. And that's right. where the, he's the big boss. He's the big boss. He's the, like the Pope. Well, n not really. Not really. Okay. He's, he is the head of, of um, the spiritual head of, of many Orthodox Christians worldwide, but um, we would not say that he is like the Pope because he doesn't, we don't claim that universal um, jurisdiction. Okay. Um, he is considered first among equals, of, of the Orthodox patriarchs right. throughout the world. Good enough. And then, um, who is the Archbishop in the United the States? The Archbishop here in the United States for the last year has been Archbishop Spiridon. Spiridon. Mm -hmm. And who was it before that? Well, our, that was Archbishop Yakovos. Yakovos. Mm -hmm. And he was here in Akron not too long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I met him. Yeah, he was here in 1988. Yes, and he had a cold. But he still spoke beautifully. Yes, he was a very eloquent man. Just a beautiful, beautiful man. He's an old, old man at the time. He's 80 some years old at the time, was he not? Yes, and he's, right. he's since retired. Just out of curiosity, uh, there are, what, nine Orthodox churches in Akron? Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about why there are nine Orthodox churches and only yours is called the Greek Orthodox Church? Well, the, the, uh, the way that the churches are here in Akron is a sort of a microcosm of the way they are throughout the, the country, and that is that orthodoxy was brought to the United States by immigration, and uh, was one of the first places where orthodoxy really came to the country that it's in through that process. And so we still are working through that, having the orthodox um, being together, united in faith, but yet still have some ties to, to, the, to their homeland. To their homeland. Tell us the difference between the nine different Orthodox churches in Akron. Well, the, I guess the difference is there are some that have their roots with Russia, roots with uh, Antioch, roots with uh, Serbia, um, Romania, um, and... Um, the theology is the same, the, theology the language is, is different. Uh, although, yeah, the, the, the language is different. Usually only the, um, pretty much only the Greeks and the, uh, the Serbs are still maintaining a, a language that... Um, that is used liturgically and, and amongst the, the people. Many of the other um, faiths or many other jurisdictions, especially ones that had anything to do with the Soviet bloc countries, have not had a, an influx of, of immigrants, so there was no um, sort of no people to, to come and to maintain that, um, the, the need for the language and, and that kind of thing. But it is a language thing more than anything else. When we say it, Romanian Orthodox, the, the theology is the same, but the language is different. Yeah, there is a, there is a complete unity of faith among, among all, amongst all of these different That's Orthodox right. faiths. And the only difference in the jurisdictions is just 
a, um, an issue of, of, of how that church came to this country. As of five years ago, I was the only person ever to have addressed all nine congregations in Akron. Very interesting. And I addressed the congregation at the Annunciation um, Greek Orthodox Church 12 different times. Beautiful. And I got that because I, I was given that privilege because of my relationship with Father Bartz and with his children and also then uh, became uh, very much involved with the other ones through the university and uh, had several of the priests at the university who were my cons consulees, mm -hmm. uh, Father Freuta and um, uh, Father, um, well, his wife is a uh, model, uh, Father, I um, can't think of his name right now, his wife is a... Father uh, Zuder. Father Zuder, right, mm -hmm. Father Zuder. And um, I can't think of all of it. And Father, uh, well, he's the assistant, uh, but through his daughter, I, I met Father um, uh, Barkislava. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Barkajeva in the Romanian uh, church and um, uh, had a, a relationship there with them. Now, uh, Father Jerry, how about giving us some background on differences between um, differences and similarities? And I'm, I'm not talking about theology now, but differences and similarities in the relationships between the Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Greek Orthodox Church and the Protestant churches. Uh, how, what is your relationship among all of these? Well, I, th I think the, the best way to, to look at that is in terms of just a little bit of, a little bit of history. And you, that's perfectly okay. A, a, little bit of, a little bit of history, and that is that we, we understand that the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church were, were, were one church, were a united church for the first thousand years of, of Christian history. Um, and so because of that, and because of what happened during those first thousand years, as far as a developing a common understanding of, of faith and who is the person of Jesus Christ and who is the, the Holy Trinity um, and um, those, those basic, very basic foundational um, elements of our Christian faith, those are, are shared in common. The, uh, the sacramental life of the church is very much um, similar between the, the Roman Catholic and the, uh, and Orthodox. the Orthodox uh, churches. Um, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that um, for almost a thousand years now, for almost that same amount of time, the, there has been a split between the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the, and the Orthodox Church. And that is churches. called the schism. That was the great schism, right? The great schism. S-C-H-I-S-M. Right. Okay. Which uh, means a split. A split, exactly. And what was the reason for that split? Well, the, um, there was a... a, a different reasons. There were some, some uh, theological reasons. There had been a, a change in the, uh, the wording of the, uh, the Nicene Creed that was recited, um, a small change in, in, in the, the wording, an addition that happened in the, in the West, in the, in the Roman practice, that caused um, some theological tensions. There was, um, there was some cultural and, and linguistic differences that happened. The, the, the language in the, uh, in the West, in, the, in Rome, began, became Latin. The, the language in the East was predominantly Greek, so there was a, a, an increasing difficulty for them to communicate um, clearly and effectively when they had to deal with different theological issues and practical issues as well. Um, there was political and social factors that, that came into play. Um, and because of some of those political social factors in the West and around Rome, the, um, the, the Bishop of Rome became increasingly more and more um, powerful as, as, as time went on. And um, he began, the, the Pope of the Bishop of Rome began to exert his, um, his power and um, began to sort of the beginnings of the uh, claim of universal jurisdiction over all of the churches began to take began to take shape, and uh, that caused a reaction with the, uh, the bishops in the, uh, in the East. And um, so it was those, um, those issues that were at, at stake, and, um, and that's what basically you know, caused the, uh, the split in, in 1054. Um, and at the time in 1054, it was something that the split happened, and it was something that um, really was only, people were only aware of on a, um, sort of a, a, a church level. 
um, it wasn't sort of a, a popular understanding among the people until, until the Crusades. And then that was a, a fairly devastating thing that happened as the Crusaders were on their way to, um, to, uh, to the Holy Land. Um, some things um, happened and there were some skirmishes and, and churches were um, damaged and destroyed and, and some lives were lost. Um, that really sort of cemented the, the belief on a grassroots level that we were no longer united as, as, a, as, as one, one church. One right. church. Um, and so then as the, uh, the two churches, you know, continued on their, on their ways, the Roman Catholic Church under the, uh, the guidance of the, of the Pope and the, and the Orthodox churches continued to, um, to um, govern themselves with um, the uh, conciliar nature that had existed you know, earlier on in those first thousand years um, of the conciliar amongst all of the, the bishops and leaders of the church. Um, and then what happened was uh, later on, um, the 15th century, there was um, the, uh, the monk Martin Luther who began to uh, question and, and uh, look at some, some abuses that were taking place in the, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and wrote his, um, his 95 theses that uh, were just 95 different areas where he thought that things that needed to be changed and found himself uh, outside of the church. And, and basically that's the beginning of the Protestant Reformation with, uh, with uh, the Lutheran Church, with Martin Luther. And once that, uh, that, that he began to, he was you know, cut off and split off, then it sort of was like the, the first crack in, the, in a piece of glass there's another crack and another one and another one and those splinters sort of kept shooting off from, from the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And um, so that's sort of see how we relate ourselves is that, you know, there was, if you look at it as a timeline, there's, there's a line going for a thousand years of the, of the Orthodox or the, of the Christian Church together. Then there's the split and you have the Orthodox going on and the Roman Catholic doing both of their things and then sort of branching off of the, of the Roman Catholics from, uh, from of the Protestants. And Father Jerry, what, um, what, would you what would you attribute to the fact that the Greek Church, the Greek Orthodox, or the Orthodox Church, not the Greek Orthodox, the Orthodox Church has never had such a split? Um, well, I, I really can't say why, we, why that, why that hasn't, you know, why that hasn't are happened. Are there any I mean, splits at all? There, there are some splinter groups as well um, amongst Orthodox, but those groups that have, um, have uh, splintered off through, through time were not so much on uh, theological basis as they were Social? on... Social? Um, more administrative. administrative. There's, uh, there's some groups that are, um, that are splintered off when there was a change in the, in the calendar. The Orthodox Church for many centuries had gone by the Julian calendar, and then um, with the advent of the, the Gregorian calendar, there was a, a change, and now those are, there's a difference of about 13 days in those two calendars. There was a split over that. Can you tell us why we had the um, Julian calendar and what proposed um, the change for a Gregorian calendar? Well, the Julian calendar was, by, was formed by Julius Caesar. Right. Okay, so it was the time, from that, that time. Um, then they, dis they discovered under um, Pope Gregory, I think, um, I can't remember the century, my history is, uh, leaves me there, the dates leave me there, but they discovered that the calendar was in error um, and had been losing um, days. And so the, under Gregory, they came up with a, a new formulation for a new calendar that, that we have today that has the, 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 uh, the leap year added in it for those, to make, uh, the to make that correction. Um, and now they have atomic clocks that correct themselves once every two billion years. Right, like right. That. They have it down pretty accurately. Um, do you have any, any feel, Father, for why the Orthodox churches um, retained the Julian calendar? Do you think that it was just a matter of um, tradition, or was there a, a good substantial reason for it? No, it, I think it was more just a matter of, of tradition, of what they had wanted to do. And um, early on, I think it was a... Um, um, a rejection of that they did not want to participate in anything that was coming from the West, and so they maintained the... It was um, an East-West kind of a thing, more sure. than a Roman Catholic and an Orthodox. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, when I say West, I'm talking about the, the Western Church or the okay, Roman Church. the Western Church, Church and, the, and, the, and Eastern. the Eastern Church. Now, um, you do not follow the, the Julian calendar as far as um, uh, paying your taxes and uh, 
uh, looking at the television uh, schedule or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You followed the Gregorian. Correct, and even the and most of the most of the churches in the, through worldwide follow the Gregorian calendar now. There was an overall except for except what? for the um, well, the church in Russia is still in the Julian calendar. The church in Serbia and the Serbian parishes here in this country are still on the um, old calendar. The uh, uh, the monks of Mount Athos are on the uh, on the old calendar as well. Now, however, the Greek Orthodox do celebrate Easter and Christmas at a different time, is that correct? Not Christmas. This, uh, this Christmas Easter. is December 25th with, with the rest of the world. The only change, the only difference is, is in, the, um, in the celebration of, of Easter, or Pascha as we call it, um, is there is a use of the, both of the Julian calendar and there's some other factors that come into play. Um, as far as waiting till the celebration of the Passover, right. um, that creates a difference in the usually in the date of, of the celebration of Easter, and they, they did that because for us that celebration of the resurrection of Christ is the it's the foundational the foundation of the Christian Church of the, of the Christian Church, right. and so it was very important that no matter what calendar um, anyone was following for some of the other fixed feast of the uh, of the church year that this was a feast that the entire orthodox world would celebrate together now father as we look at the orthodox church we say, see that there are, the sacraments are the same as they are in the in the uh, um, in the catholic church mm -hmm. uh, however um, there is is there a difference uh, in the um, the communion of the population uh, in terms of whether a Greek Orthodox could receive communion in a Roman Catholic Church and vice versa, is there is there any uh, is there a problem there? Well, there is there is not a, a common communion between the two churches, um, and the reason is that as, as I said, we were united in faith for a thousand years, but we have been you know disunited for a thousand years, and so the, for for both for the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, the the celebration and the receiving of communion is is a celebration of the unity that exists amongst the members of that church. Right. Um, and so, unless a complete and total unity exists among there all is not these communion. people, there is no communion. communion so the communion means common. Exactly. Right. Communion is not, is not the whole, the receiving of the Eucharist, the body and blood That's of Christ, right. is not a means to the end. It is, it is the, the end, end itself. It is the end itself. I understand that. Now then, how about this question? Um, the many churches, whether Protestant denominations or whatever, except for the Roman Catholic Church so far and the Greek Orth or the Orthodox churches, still accept only men as priests. Mm -hmm. um, is that about to change in the Greek Orthodox Church, do you think? No. It is not. And what about the, um, the restrictions on diet, the dietary restrictions? Uh, they are still as they were 2,000 years ago. Am I wrong or am I right on yeah, that? Yeah, the Orthodox, Orthodox Church has, has still maintained a um, practice of fasting throughout, um, throughout its history. There have been, been no changes. There's a, a fast that's practiced on, on Mondays and Wednesdays um, and uh, at various times various longer periods of time, the 40 days of, of Great Lent. We're coming up on a period of time from the 15th of November to till, till Christmas is a time of, of fasting and Advent. preparation. Advent is a time of fasting and preparation for, uh, for Orthodox Christians because in that tradition the idea is that there is a fasting period before the feast in order to prepare for the feast, the feast. and then once the feast comes then, the, then that's the time to begin to fast. We really run into a especially with, uh, with Christmas coming up, we run into a real culture clash here in the United States. We have because, all kinds of dinners beforehand. Oh, everything, right. everything right. is celebrated beforehand, and once Christmas comes, right. it's, we're done. That's right, and that, that and is not the way that the Christian church is, is supposed no. to be organized. Is exactly. That right? Now, when you uh, describe fast to us, and what about abstinence, uh, abstinence from eating meat? Uh, what about those? Well, the, the idea of fasting is that um, it's it's a, a couple of things. It reminds us that uh, that our source of life is with with God and not within the things that we put into our into our mouths. Um, and it also is a it's a spiritual exercise for us as well. That as are we um, say no to our stomachs that are very powerful motivators of us. Some of <laughs> have more powerful motivators than others. <laughs> but uh, as we as we say no to our stomachs, 
we, we also learn to be strengthened to, to say no to other temptations to other and temptations, other things that, right. uh, that come our way. When you fast, it's not, not, not uh, devoid of any meals at all. No, it's, when uh, we fast, there's a, um, it's what we call an ascetical fast or a disciplinary fast. And there is a change in, one, the amount of foods that are eaten and in some of the foods as well that are eaten. That, uh, Could you describe that a little more detail? Well, the practice, the, uh, sort of the, pra the practice today that happens most often is that people will abstain from, at least at the very least, um, meat products on those days, on Wednesdays and Fridays. But um, I thought you said Monday and Wednesday. No, on Wednesdays and Fridays. Yeah, so I was wondering about that. Did I that. say Monday yeah, and Wednesday? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, no, on Wednesdays and Fridays. I, I thought it was Fridays. Wednesday and Friday, but Wednesday I didn't want to correct it because you're the priest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and uh, we fast from, and as well, if we, if we take it to the, the, uh, the more stricter um, part of the fast would be to fast from meat and dairy products as well on those days. Um, a much simpler meal is eaten. Um, it, it, uh, when we eat, we remove those other foods from our diet, we really find ourselves more, um, more aware, less weighed down by the whole digestive process. And um, so there's a, there's a lot of factors that come into play where our bodies and our souls, our bodies and our spiritual life, our physical life and spiritual life are really connected. Um, and so we, you know, we have that sense that there is that connection there. Um, so, the, so that's the, the sort of the, um, the vary that happens in the diet. Then there is a time of, of, of absence, a total fast that happens, that is a, a total fast that is, is kept before receiving Holy Communion. And how, how long is that fast? That's from, from a very, the very least from about midnight the night before you receive Holy Communion until after you have received uh, Communion on that day. And, and that uh, comes, comes back from two practices. One, the Jewish practice that um, um, the, the morning prayers were, were said and, and attended to without having eaten anything. And, and as well, again, the sort of the connection of body and soul is that when we, when we have this total fast, it, it places us in a, st a state of expectation so that we are um, ready and more prepared to in, in, in expectation of receiving these, these holy things of the body and blood of Christ. A little, uh, <clears throat> for the want of a better word, a logistic kind of a thing. When you were growing up and you went to um, Trinity Church, mm -hmm. the service lasted probably not more than an hour. What is the length of the, of the liturgy in the Greek Orthodox Church and how much of a problem was for you to change from having the one hour service to a, maybe a two hour liturgy or an hour and a half to two hour liturgy? Yeah. Well, actually the length of the liturgy is probably about about the same. It's about a, it takes about an hour to celebrate the Divine Liturgy um, on, a, on a parish level. If you have, um, when the bishop is there, if there's a hierarchical liturgy, it's a little bit longer because there's some things that are added that, that he does out of the liturgical tradition that, that don't happen on other, um, on other days when, when just the parish priest is celebrating. But um, it's the process of, of giving communion to the, all of the faithful that can add another 20 minutes or even longer, depending upon how many people are receiving Holy Communion that day, and then, and then a sermon, so that um, it, it, can, it can, you know, add up to about a two hour, or hour and a half um, time period. Um, but I think um, the, by our Bishop Maximus always tells us that uh, when we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, the theology of our church says that we enter the Kingdom of God. And so there is no time and there's no space. There's no time, so, that, no space. Uh, so it's, he says it's actually a sinful thing for us to do to look at our watch. We're supposed to be uh, oblivious right. to time. Oblivious to time. That time, that's right. Father, tell us your day. You start, this is Monday morning. You start out Monday morning, what do you do? What um, time? I, well, I get up early, six, six o'clock, and um, have my, uh, personal, my personal prayer time. And, uh, then and there's a prescribed prayer. Is that right? It's called yeah. the office. Is that it? Well, there is there is very various offices that uh, that you can have, and then each usually each individual person will have a person what we call a rule of, of prayer that uh, they have developed through their own conversations with their with their spiritual father, and and that's the sort of the time that you spend um, in personal prayer and, and meditation. And how long does that last? Um, that can that can vary from from person to person from. From just a few minutes to, 
to, uh, to 45 minutes to an hour, depending upon what you do and if you include some, some reading time and scripture study in that, in that amount of time. Now, 6 o'clock is your time. You don't have to be up at 6 o'clock to do this. Is that correct? No. No, okay. that's my time. That's okay, my so 6 schedule. o'clock you read until when? Well, until uh, till about uh, 7 o'clock. It's time for my, we, we get the kids going. We have four children. And, uh, so and we they, want to hear about those four children before the end of the hour, yeah. but tell us what you do then. Um, then they, they get up. We have to get things going and get, get rolling for our day. The kids go to school. I'm usually at my office by, um, by uh, sometime 8.15 to 8.30. And, and uh, we have a, I mean, have a very large community in Akron. It's uh, about 600 families. So there's, there's quite a few demands. And there's always something coming up, whether it's... Uh, sermon preparation or Bible studies or other administrative issues that need to be taken care of. And then there's hospital calls and, and, and um, confessions and people to visit that, uh, that, that fill, my, fill my day. Now, uh, do, you, um, do, you not have, you, do you have liturgy every day? No. Just on Sunday? Uh, on Sundays and, and... Holy days. On holy days, yeah. Right, but no, days. but not, it's not a daily it's thing not a daily as a, in the Roman Catholic right. Church where they have it every day. Now, I heard another word here, uh, reconciliation, confession. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear confessions. Sure. And this is still a very active part of the Greek Orthodox Church, as it is, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church. How was that, um, well, for the, uh, let's, let's say, for, how was that change? Uh, how did you accept that change? Well, I think... Because you did not do that in the Protestant Church. No, I church. didn't. And that was, that was probably one of the hardest things I had to, to learn to do, um, was to to incorporate that into part of my spiritual life. But I think in, in incorporating that and finding out what a, um, what a healing and very positive thing that that is, um, after a, a period of time, you begin to um, almost begin to look forward to, the, to that healing and, and cleansing and reconciliation that comes through that experience. Um, rather than initially, it's, we, we sort of tend to look at that and think of that in terms of some kind of uh, punitive, negative experience right. rather than positive a healing, thing. positive very thing positive that it thing. is. Surely. Father, do you have, um, do you hear, how often do you hear confessions? I have um, at least once a week. And, um, and they, they come, I don't, we don't have a specific set time that I'm there for c confessions. It's, it's uh, more on a, um, an appointment basis with, within the Orthodox uh, Church, although during, during Great Lent and as we come across um, near to some of the major feast days, I'll set aside a time where I'm, I'm there just to hear confessions and, and people can just come and without... Are the confessions face to face? Yes. Always. always. And they always have been. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's something that I think is significant as well. Now, Father, as you go through your day and you do all of this counseling, you have all kinds of meetings, you have Bible study and you have um, uh, organizational meetings and all these other kinds of things, um, do you ever yearn for the times when you were a young kid in Wadsworth and um, uh, maybe you didn't have to do all of these kinds of things? Or do you really enjoy loving these very precious Greek women and men, uh, some of whom are up in years and probably have their own ideas and probably consider you as a little boy? But how, how, did you, how did you assimilate all of these kinds of things in your life, which was so different when you were growing up? Yeah. Well, I mean... I've, I've said many times, if anyone would have told me that, uh, you know, as, even as a, as a student here at Wadsworth High School, that I was going to become a Greek Orthodox priest, I would have first not known what they were talking about, and two, would have just been, you know, told them they were, they were crazy. Um, but, um, but I wouldn't trade the things that I'm doing now for, for and you anything. Love it. I love it. It's and these are wonderful, wonderful people, are they not? These they are. are they the are. older and ladies, especially, and the older men, is, is too. But it is a beautiful community, and like I said, they've just been. They have been very accepting of, of me and, and, and Helene and our family, and it's 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 really a wonderful, wonderful community in Akron. We're going to run out of time unless we get three or four things taken care of here. Okay. I want to hit those before we do. Tell us about your four children, who they are, where they go to school, and tell us a little okay. bit about. Them. I have I have four boys. My oldest is. 16. His name is Mark, and he's a uh, junior at Cuyahoga Valley Christian Academy. And, and then I have a, a second son whose name is Scott. He is uh, 14, and he's a freshman at the same uh, Cuyahoga Valley Christian Academy. My third son, Jerry Jr., is 11. He's a fifth grader in, uh, at uh, Richardson School in the Falls, where we live in Cuyahoga Falls. And our, our last son is Luke. 
and he's a first grader, he's six, and he's also at the, at the Falls Public Schools. And, and you, the, all of your children went to public school and then they went to the high school at the uh, CCVA? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The um, other question we want to ask um, uh, regarding your family, tell us a little bit about um, uh, Presbytera Helene. Well, what does she do? Presbytera Helene is um, involved with, uh, with the community and is also, um, as of the last few years, has gone back to, uh, to work in the pharmacy part-time. So she works for Klein's Pharmacy in, uh, in the falls and um, does a very good job of, of balancing a lot of responsibilities. She also, as far as the church goes, has, has uh, started a few, about uh, six or seven years ago a, uh, a, a mom's study group and uh, they meet on a weekly basis and that's been a, a really beautiful part of of her sort of aspect of, of the ministry and getting these women together and has has made some significant changes in, in the lives of the families and um, that uh, these Tell us why they call her Presbytera, number one, and number two, what are her responsibilities and duties uh, theologically? Well, Presbytera comes is sort of a, is the um, female counterpart of the, the priest. The Greek uh, word for the priest is um, presbyteros or presbyter. Presbyteros. Yes, which means sort of the leader or the, leader, the president, right. of, mm -hmm. president of that uh, particular uh, assembly, that church. And so the presbytera is sort of a, a, a feminine form of that, so it means just the wife of that um, Does that she have priest. duties? Actually, the, the role of the presbytera is, um, is, is, is very varied. I mean, there are, she has no specific duties. She's, uh, she is, you know, free to do what she wants. She's obviously, you know, supportive of her, of her husband and his, his ministry. And uh, you have presbyteras who are full-time working women. You have presbyteras who are full-time moms and are very involved in the, in the life of the parish. And you have, you know, a whole spectrum in between of, of what, uh, what they do. The presbytera then is a, um, well, an honorary title. Yes. But it's not an honorary respect. It's a highly respected position, is it not? Yes, it is. And the, the, the parish really, I think, does show their you know, respect and love for the, the, the wife of the priest and, and the priest's family. And the whole family. Now, you went to your 25th anniversary of your high school graduation. Yes. What did uh, John Jones and Mary Smith and all of these other people who regarded you as one of the kids on the block, how did they regard you when you walked in with your uh, clerics on and um, uh, introducing, which you didn't do, of course, but introducing your wife as this is Presbytera Helene and I'm Father Bart, I'm mm -hmm. Father uh, Hall. How did, how did that hit them? Well, I think um, sometimes people are surprised because they look back and they think of the the uh, the crazy things that we did as as high school kids growing up here in Wadsworth and and so sometimes I think it seems if you think of it in terms of of that it may seem incongruous that you could end up in this uh, in this position but um, you know we all grow and we all mature and um, people are very respectful and and I think a lot of the people have as well grown in their own spiritual life and their own um, involvement in their own their own faiths and 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 really um, have when, been very supportive and, and been respectful of, of what, um, what, you're what doing. I'm doing. When you went to your 25th anniversary, did you wear your clerics? Sure. You did. And that was the surprise to anyone, or did they all know about I think this? by that time, people had been aware of the fact that I was, uh, was a Greek Orthodox priest. Yeah. Father, as I indicated earlier, you certainly cannot be old enough to give us much of the history of Wadsworth, but you have made history in Wadsworth and something we're extremely proud of, very, very happy that, that uh, we have a Greek Orthodox priest from Wadsworth and a person who has such a strong emphasis on the fabric of Wadsworth being part of that other community. It helps to bring, as you said earlier, this diversity. It helps to bring diversity home and the diversity is, I think, if I can um, spot some of the things that you have said here, diversity is obviously the will of God, otherwise he would have not made young Jerry Hall a Greek Orthodox priest. We are grateful to you for having shared with us today, and unfortunately our time is up. Father, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.